hear me? Hold on one minute. Good morning! We're so glad to have you here this morning. You know, sometimes with all the noise and talking going on around us, it's really hard to know who to listen to. Between our tablets and our phones and our computers and our TV and our music, sometimes it's really hard to listen or even to know who we should be listening to. Hey, 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 are you listening? Yeah, you in the back. Hey, yeah, I see you. Put down the phone. Are you listening? Sometimes your mom might sound just like that. Maybe she'll ask you, are you listening? What she really means isn't, do you hear me, but are you paying attention? Sometimes it can be really hard to listen and pay attention, can it? We want to pay attention, but when our parents and teachers start talking, sometimes our minds are somewhere else and all we hear is... <laughs> It is really important that we learn to listen. You know, this reminds me of a family ministry moment from a few months back. Let's take a look. I'm just out here on my porch, relaxing for a little bit before church gets started and listening to the sounds of God's creation all around me. Why don't you listen and see what sounds you can hear? Was that? Those were some pretty crazy sounds. What did you hear? I couldn't believe I could hear all that from my porch. You know, you never know what you're going to hear if you just stop and listen. Sometimes we need to stop and listen for the voice of God. In 1 Kings chapter 19, the prophet Elijah is hiding in a cave. From his enemies fearing for his life he cries out to God and God tells him to move to the mouth of the cave when he's at the mouth of the cave Elijah listens for God and a mighty wind rushes past the cave so strong it shakes the rocks right off the mountain but God was not in the wind and then there was an earthquake but God was not in the earthquake and then there was a fire but God was not in the fire. And finally, there was a gentle breeze. And on the breeze, Elijah heard God speak. Elijah learned to listen to God. Right after this, God told Elijah to go find another man named Elisha, who would be prophet one day after Elijah. Elijah went and found him and made him his helper. Elisha went everywhere Elijah went and learned from him. Hmm, Elisha and Elijah, those sound an awful lot alike. I guess you're going to have to listen and find out who is who. Back, let's play a game. I'm going to tell you a story from the Bible about Elijah and Elisha. Every time I say the name Elijah, raise your right hand. Every time I say the name Elisha, raise your left. Got it? Elijah? Elisha. Let's practice. Elijah. Elisha. Elijah. Elijah. Oh, tried to trick you. Elisha. All right, I think you've got it. Let's go. When the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were walking along the way from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Bethel. But, Elisha said, As surely as the Lord lives and you live, I will not leave you. So they went on to Bethel. The company of the prophets at Bethel came out to Elisha and asked, Do you know that the Lord is going to take your master from you today? Yes, I know, replied Elisha, so be quiet. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. 
But Elijah replied, As surely as the Lord lives, and you live, I will go with you. So they went to Jericho. The company of the prophets at Jericho came up to Elijah and asked him, Do you know that the Lord is going to take your master from you today? Yes, I know, Elisha replied, so be quiet. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But Elisha replied, As surely as the Lord lives and you live, I will not leave you. So they went on to the Jordan. Fifty men from the company of prophets went out to the Jordan and stood on the banks, facing the place where Elijah and Elisha had stopped at the Jordan. Elijah took his coat, rolled it up, and struck the water with it. The water divided to the right and the left, and the two men walked across on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, What can I do for you before I am taken from you? Let me inherit a double portion of your spirit, Elisha replied. You have asked a difficult thing, Elisha said. Yet if you see me when I am taken from you, it will be yours. Otherwise, it will not. As they were walking along together, suddenly a chariot of fire and horses of fire appeared and separated the two men, and Elijah was taken up to heaven in a whirlwind. Elisha saw this and cried out, My father, my father, the chariots and horsemen of Israel. And Elisha saw Elijah no more. Immediately after Elijah went up to heaven, the Holy Spirit moved powerfully on Elisha. He took Elijah's cloak, rolled it up, and smacked the river, and the water moved out of the way just as it had done for Elijah. Wow, did you hear all that? Were you listening? Let's try this one more time. When the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were walking along the way from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Bethel. But, Elisha said, As surely as the Lord lives and you live, I will not leave you. So they went on to Bethel. The company of the prophets of Bethel came out to Elisha and asked, Do you know that the Lord is going to take your master from you today? Yes, I know, replied Elisha, so be quiet. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But Elijah replied, As surely as the Lord lives and you live, I will go with you. So they went to Jericho. The company of the prophets of Jericho came up to Elisha and asked him, Do you know that the Lord is going to take your master from you today? Yes, I know, Elisha replied, so be quiet. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But Elisha replied, As surely as the Lord lives and you live, I will not leave you. So they went on to the Jordan. Fifty men from the company of prophets went out to the Jordan and stood on the banks, facing the place where Elijah and Elisha had stopped at the Jordan. Elijah took his coat, rolled it up, and struck the water with it. The water divided to the right and the left, and the two men walked across on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, What can I do for you before I am taken from you? Let me inherit a double portion of your spirit, Elisha replied. You have asked a difficult thing, Elisha said. Yet if you see me when I am taken from you, it will be yours. Otherwise, it will not. As they were walking along together, suddenly a chariot of fire and horses of fire appeared and separated the two men, and Elijah was taken up to heaven in a whirlwind. Elisha saw this and cried out, My father, my father, the chariots and horsemen of Israel. And Elisha saw Elijah no more. Immediately after Elijah went up to heaven, the Holy Spirit moved powerfully on Elisha. He took Elijah's cloak, rolled it up, and snapped the river, and the water moved out of the way just as it had done. Elisha followed Elijah and listened to him. There are lots of people that it's important for us to listen to. Our parents, our grandparents, our teachers, and other people that we know love God. But there are lots of other things to listen to as well. And not all of them say things that are pleasing to God. So here's your challenge this week. Put those things down and listen. Really listen to your parents and to God. Good morning, Penn Forest Worship Center. It is Pastor Heather here with your announcements. Not too many this week, just a reminder that we are meeting on Wednesday. The teens and the kids will be outside um, and the adults will be in the sanctuary for Bible study. And so it's such a great time of fellowship. Last week, um, even the adults were out playing volleyball and just a good time of fellowship and to come together. So make sure that you do join us on Wednesday nights. And then if you haven't seen My Brother's Crossing, it's a movie. We've had JT Clark and Terry here um, to talk. If you haven't seen that, just make it a make it a point to go and see that at the theaters. We saw it at Tanglewood. I know it's also at Valley View, I believe. Um, but just look that up online and make it a point to go see it. You'll be so blessed by the movie. Also, you need to look for Pastor Myron's feet. Um, they're famous now, you know. Um, but just make it a point and go be blessed by the movie and share that with others uh, because it really is a great story of forgiveness. Make it a date night. Take the kids. 
It's fantastic. As we um, go forth and we continue to talk about um, just being blessed, one of the biggest ways you can be blessed is by giving back to God what's his, right? He's just so grateful to let us keep just a small part of it. Um, actually, we get to keep the biggest portion of it. So that's kind of cool. Um, I mean, that's not the way it was growing up, right? Your mother would say, cut the cake in half and then give your brother a piece. And then, you know, I would cut the cake in half and then she would let my brother pick what piece we wanted, right? Aren't we grateful that God doesn't do that to us? There are three ways to give. You can give online by going to pfwc.net. You can text the word give to 540-264-3735, or you can mail your check to 3735 Chaparral Drive, Roanoke, Virginia, 24018. We're so grateful for your faithfulness in giving. And now if you're able, please stand to worship with the Penn Force worship team. God is building a home. He's using us all, irrespective of how we got here and what he is building. He used the apostles and prophets for the foundation. Now he's using you, fitting you in brick by brick, stone by stone, with Christ Jesus as a cornerstone that holds all the parts together.
so that all will go well with you and your children after you, because you will be doing what is good and pleasing to the Lord your God. Sound of his voice. 
as we come before you this morning, I know there are many people watching online, many people that are here in this place, many people in our world that are struggling. They don't have that peace in the midst of the storm. They can't say it is well with my soul. And this morning, Father, I ask that you would just send your Holy Spirit to speak mightily to each and every individual that is listening to this this day. Listening to the, the songs as we worship you, listening to the scriptures as we worship you, giving in the act of worship, listening to the scripture in the sermon as an act of worship, and listening to the prayer. Speak. I pray for those that are struggling physically. I ask that we continue to touch Dave Adams right now in Jesus' name. My brother Mark. Kristen Batten. And so many others that need a touch. Names that my human brain forgets at the moment. But you know. And I ask that you would just intercede. And your Holy Spirit would be touching them right now with our government, with our nation, with our world, with the churches around America. I pray that you would just bring a revival within the churches. I pray that you would bring a revival right here, right now in this place. And there would be an awakening in our nation. Thank you for what you're going to do. Thank you that one day you're going to return again. And may we be prepared for that day to hear you say, well done. Thank you for all. We love you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. We're so glad to have you with us this morning. Whether you're joining us inside, outside, online, or by DVD, we welcome you back to Penn Forest Worship Center. I'm Pastor Paul, the family life pastor here at the church. And this morning we've been talking about listening. Earlier we talked about to the kids, who are you listening to? And Elijah listened to God. And Elisha listened to Elijah. In fact, when Elisha asked Elijah for a double portion of his spirit, he wasn't asking for twice as much as Elijah had. He was asking for the double portion a son would receive, the oldest son would receive, as a blessing. So he looked to Elijah as a father. So my question for you today, dads, moms, grandparents, is who is listening to you? In his song, 
watching you, Rodney Atkins tells about how while traveling through town with his little boy, he comes to a sudden stop at a traffic light, causing his son to spill his drink. He's shocked to hear his son utter, as he puts it, a four-letter word. When he asks, where did you learn to talk like that? His son's response is, I've been watching you, Dad. Ain't that cool? I'm your buckaroo. I want to be like you. I'll eat all my food and be just as strong as you are. We've got cowboy boots and camo pants. Hey, we're just alike, aren't we, Dad? I want to do everything you do. I've been watching you. Taken aback by his, this revelation, Atkins goes to the barn and prays to God for help. Later that night, he spies his son praying as if he were talking to a friend. When he asks him, where did you learn to pray like that? His son's response is, I've been watching you, Dad. Ain't that cool? Now, many of us are past the years of little boys with Scooby-Doo nightlights riding in car seats and looking up to us as superheroes, but make no mistake, whether you have kids or teens or college students, maybe your kids are grown with kids of their own, or maybe you never had kids at all, but someone is watching you. We're going to be looking today at the very last section of 2 Kings chapter 2. You heard the events leading up to this story earlier during the family ministry moment, so I hope you were listening. But before we get into that, let's talk about children's ministry and family ministries here at Penn Forest. Because children and family ministry has always been important to this church, and I'm glad for that. But the way we do ministry, while it hasn't stopped, is very different than it was a year ago or even eight or nine months ago. The way we look at ministry has changed. The way we look at life has changed. If I had delivered this report last May, I would have been talking about how many kids we had at camp the previous summer and that we are yet again the largest group of kids from any church in the district. I would talk about the incredible experiences the, kid had, had, the kids had at camp and how hopefully it touched their lives and how I know that it touched mine. I would have talked about VBS and how we had kids coming from all over the community hearing the message of God's love. How thankful I am for all the volunteers that made it happen. How we partnered with Emmanuel Wesleyan to help them put off their, pull off their very first VBS in years. I would have talked about all of the fun of district conference and going to teen camp. And I would have said how much I was looking forward to all of that again this summer. But that didn't happen, did it? There was no Children's Sunday, no family festival, no camps, no district conference. We did have VBS, and it was an amazing experience. And while we only had 20 kids, I feel it was one of my favorite VBSs we've ever had. Not because it was less hectic, I don't think that ever changes, but because we had the opportunity to personally connect with each child there. That's one thing I've learned during this pandemic. Bigger isn't always better. We're so driven by numbers sometimes, and we love to brag about how many we had at just this event or that. But while Jesus had throngs of people following him, he chose 12, only 12 to pour his spirit into. The way we look at attendance and numbers isn't the only thing that's changed, though. The ministry of the church never stopped during the pandemic, but instead of being here in the church, we moved outside the church. Now, I mean much more than just we had church outside. I mean, we, as the body of Christ, learned to move beyond our doors, beyond limitations we thought we had before. We checked on our neighbors, the elderly and friends we hadn't spoken to in years. We made phone calls. We wrote letters. I tried to make sure every kid and family received some special form of contact each week. Whether it was a surprise in the mail or a box dropped off at their doorstep, I mean, I spent many hours driving around town delivering boxes, not just to regular kids, but others as well, making sure that no one felt forgotten about during this time of isolation. 
And instead of meeting together for meals and events, we tried our hand at virtual events, including a very fun virtual master chef, where we all got together by Zoom and cooked and ate together online. Sometimes we seemed busier during the pandemic than we were before, with online programming up to three times a week or more. But through all these changes, all these challenges, another realization hit me. One that's been there for a long time, but it was suddenly pushed to the forefront. We can't rely on the church alone to provide for our children's special, spiritual needs. It's not my job alone to make sure these kids are getting fed spiritually. It's not even Myron and Heather and me together. What we need to do, I realized, is come alongside our families, our parents and our grandparents to partner with them to provide the spiritual nourishment their families so desperately crave. Last week, Pastor Myron delivered what he called the State of the Church Address. Today, I want to take a different approach. I'm going to speak to the state of the family, and it's not good. Our families are under attack from all sides, from the media, from political groups disguised in the name of social justice, from TV, from the internet, and movies where we see abnormal relationships portrayed as normal, and the traditional definition of family being attacked as bigoted, closed-minded, and backwards. So that brings me back to my question. Who is watching you, and what are they seeing? Let's turn to 2 Kings chapter 2, starting in verse 23. From there, Elisha went up to Bethel. As he was walking along the road, some boys came out of the town and jeered at him. Get out of here, baldy! They said, get out of here, baldy! He turned around, looked at them, and called down a curse on them in the name of the Lord. Then two bears came out of the woods and mauled 42 of the boys. And he went out to, on to Mount Carmel, and from there returned to Samaria. Now, many people look at this as kind of a strange verse. Maybe they're entertained by it. Maybe some people are disturbed. I mean, was Elisha just a grumpy old man that was bothered by his male pattern baldness? Did this really bother him so much that these boys were making fun of him that he had to call down bears on him? I mean, maybe some of you can relate to the story of baldness. I don't know, but... What's really going on here? Let's take a look and see. First, this probably wasn't just a group of young kids. Youth is taken in a very broad sense. The same Hebrew word was once applied to Joseph at age 29, Absalom as an adult, and Solomon when he was 20. I mean, this is good news for those of us that are middle-aged. We can actually just say we're a little bit out of our youth. Second, Elijah didn't call the bears. God did. Joseph simply called curses on them. Third, the Bible says the bears mauled 42 of them, meaning there were probably more. Elijah's life very well may have been in danger from this gang. And if we look at a different translation and look at what the, the boys say, it says, go up, you bald head. And as in, go up to heaven. They were wishing death for him for him to follow his teacher, Elijah, to heaven. But most of this all, most of all, this is a picture of the contempt these people had, a contempt for the Lord and for his servants. They were from Bethel, the chief center of pagan worship, where Joab, Jeroboam placed his golden calf. These youth, whether they be kids, teens or young adults had grown up in a culture of pagan worship, a culture that which went directly against the scriptures, and a culture that mocked a holy God. So where do we stand today? Our kids and teens are growing up in a culture that openly mocks God and the people that follow him. They are being blasted with messages and what, that whatever lifestyle they choose is okay and that a real Christian would not only be accepting of all people, but also of their sin. They've been brought up in a culture that worships the golden calves of sports, hobbies, celebrities, and YouTubers. In a culture that promotes self-worship, the biggest golden calf being the one we see in the mirror. And as another country song says, it's all about me, all about I, all about number one. So 
as our children are growing up in this pagan, self-worshipping, self-indulging, self-glorifying culture, if it, saying, if it feels good, do it, who are they watching? Proverbs 22.6 says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Our children are receiving a lot of training. We make sure they get to school every day or these days on the computer. We stress the importance of homework and we get on their cases when they don't do it. Most of our kids are involved in some sort of sport or extracurricular activity. We drive countless miles and spend hundreds or even thousands of dollars and we emphasize practice, practice, practice. Whether it's piano or dance or gymnastics or football or baseball, we emphasize the importance of training and practicing outside of the many hours they've already spent with their coaches and teachers. And while these activities are great, let's keep this in mind. Only 0.05% of children, athletes, will go on to be professional athletes. While there is a 100% chance that they will one day come face to face with the living God. And how would we feel if our children spent only two hours a week at school? Now I know the kids would be thrilled, but let's look at what's happened recently. In-person school hours have been cut dramatically or are non-existent. Classes have moved online and parents and kids are struggling to keep up with the changes. And we are faced with outrage. Our children need, can't learn like this. They need to be in school. They need their education. And rightfully so. I'm with you 100%. But where is the care and the concern about our children's Christian education? Their spiritual well-being? Is it not just as important or maybe even more so as what they are learning at school? Yet many are content with an hour on Sunday, an hour on Wednesday, and God's word is never spoken again outside those hours. The word of the Lord is very clear. Deuteronomy 11, verses 18 and 19. So commit yourself wholeheartedly to these words of mine. Tie them to your hands and wear them on your foreheads as reminders. Teach them to your children. Talk about them when you're at home, when you're on the road when you are going to bed, and when you are up. The parents are those that are first in line to be responsible for their children's spiritual education, followed by the grandparents and other family members, and then the church. We don't have to literally write Bible verses on our doorposts or tie them to our heads, but the Lord should always be at the forefront, should always be first in our homes and our families. How do we spend those hours in the car? Most of us on our devices probably, just hopefully not the driver. How many families still eat dinner together? And if you do, what discussions take place, if any? Or do we just hurry down our food and take off for our next activity, practice, or whatever? What if we just spent part of that time talking about God and checking in to see how our children's Christian walk is going? As your child's pastor, as the family life pastor, as the one that has seen many of these teens go on into youth group and in even college, I'll say this. I want them to succeed. I want to see them go on to do great things, and I know God has great plans for them. But I also want to see us raise up a generation that's on fire for God. I can't do that on my own. Myron and Heather and I can't do that on our own. We need you to do it with us together. We need you. Will you partner with us? Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, Lord. We thank you for the gift of children and of teens and of those you've entrusted to our responsibility. Please, Lord, help us to raise up a generation, a generation on fire for you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Now, if you'll bow your head for the Lord's blessing, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you. May he lift up his countenance unto you and give you peace. Amen.